It's fantastic to be here. And I'm here with my great colleague, Mark Connor, who will be talking right after me. And we're open to questions at the end. If you have any questions, please raise your hand, and we'll try to get to them at the end of the presentation. With that, we will talk about what decentralization was, is, and will be, right? Uh, flash news. This is not the first time the computing industry is undergoing decentralization. And for that, just look at the picture here on the, uh, on, on the slide, right? So historically, we've had you know, pre-transistor mechanical computing, which was all decentralized, you know, medieval ages and, and earlier, and so on. With the advent of the first transistor, we got the mainframe, you know, the size of a room, and with a lot of terminals running to it from all over the place, extremely centralized because there was no other way to have you know, transistor-based computing out there in the open. In the 1980s, we, I would argue that we had the first wave of compute decentralization. And that happened because of uh, the invention of the personal computer. And Intel and its ecosystems uh, were really playing a critical part in, uh, you know, in the birth of the personal computer. Right? And Right now, I would argue that we are in the second phase of decentralization, which is sort of more software and services centric. And in, in interim, you know, we all know that you know, we are in the sort of cloud era. And it's also interesting to note the Microsoft CEO coming out in 2021 and saying that we've reached peak centralization. That definitely has to be uh, taken with a lot of co context because he runs one of the largest you know, cloud computing businesses on the planet today, right? Um, so, so the way we're seeing, right, it's just, you know, cycles, just like humanity goes through cycles, computing has gone through the pendulum swings of decentralization to centralization, uh, back to decentralization with PCs, and then back to centralization with cloud and web2, web2 predominantly running on the cloud, right? And then now we're staring at what could be really the next wave of compute and storage decentralization, right? So that's sort of the historic context that we've, we've started looking at decentralization uh, you know, within the company. And as you know, for any enterprise, it's not, it's not very easy or organic to get on the decentralization you know, bandwagon. So it's, been, it's really been an uphill education journey, as many of you can probably commiserate with me, right? Um, in that context, what are some of the new usages? The biggest one here is really, uh, I think as Stefan put it nicely, it's to create a bridge from Web 2 to Web 3, right? I think that's, that to us is the killer business use case. And, and you would create that both in the storage and compute vectors, right? And that's why I emphasize what I call as real time. The, 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 the real time notion is, is very important here, right? And not to diminish the great work that has been done so far in terms of, you know, uh, documenting, you know, the extremities of humanity, you know, like the, you know, the Holocaust and the war crimes and so on. That's absolutely essential. And those are like social and humanitarian business cases. But if you or use cases, if you really talk about a business use case, I think really the immediate, you know, sort of killer use case that's staring at us is this sort of multi you know trillion dollar you know web 2 services industry if you will right and um, that's where I think really uh, you know there are there are really two two parts to it so one is what I call as the real-time decentralized computer decompute the idea here is to basically selectively offload a user's web 2 instance onto their own device right and, uh, and this, is, this is especially easier and true if you're using like a high-end compute device like a personal computer, right? And, um, and I think there's been a lot of talk in the industry and, and also some concrete actions towards this direction, right? There's been terms like hybrid AI, uh, you know, thrown around and so on. The idea here is really AI inference, right? So if you've trained models that are living on the cloud, um, that basically uh, can then be brought down to the edge or the client or your device to actually run inference. And many of these devices have required AI accelerators to run them at uh, the required latency and responsiveness and, and scale. 
And so that, that is what I call as sort of the real-time decentralized compute use case. And again, the keyword real-time is very, very important there because that's what Web2 runs on. Web2 is, is all about responsiveness. It's all about real-time, right? And uh, the other related use case would be, uh, you know, real-time de-storage, right? I think Filecoin is really historically, if you look at the roadmap, you, you guys have perfected the art of file storage and archival. The question is, how do we basically get this to more real-time object storage, object interactions, and so on and so forth, storage retrieval interactions, right? And here, the simplest idea could be a personal what, because you know, can we provide each user on the planet you know, sovereignty, data sovereignty, and control over the data in terms of providing a data vault that's essentially backed by decentralized storage, right? And the, you know, and here's some some further thought, thoughts on it. But the basic idea here is, um, you know, the data vault can store the users, you know, keys, passwords, payment methods, you know, PII, um, you know, important documents, and so on and so forth. And it could also extend to, you know, social media presence and you know, media in general, and so on and so forth. But basically, it's a way to say, okay, the user owns their data, and they can basically be stewards of it, right? Uh, and, and also, the interesting part is if you look at any device, especially a personal computer device in the market, they usually have upwards of a trillion, uh, uh, sorry, uh, a terabyte or, or, or more in storage, right? And so it's possible that they could also become, you know, suppliers into this sort of real-time de-storage economy. Right? Uh, they might not be able to archive and seal and all, do all of those you know, things that Filecoin does today, but if you're making things more real time and making things more sort of um, accessible and native to uh, the users today who are largely on Web2, who are entirely on Web2, I should say, then basically, um, you know, something like this, you know, can really start speaking, you know, to the users. Um, and in, you know, coupled with that, there is a third Third usage, uh, and this has also been talked about by uh, you know several companies during the course of the last three days, which was really refreshing. Um, it was like it gave me a, uh, more confirmation that I'm not in an echo chamber by myself, you know, thinking of these things, right? So, uh, the basic idea here is what I call as the AI challenge, right? Um, and I Intel, you know, increasingly works with a lot of creators. We we supply you know specialized hardware for creators and so on. And so, you know, we are acutely familiar with this, right? Uh, familiar with this challenge. So before, and increasingly, most, more and more of the creation uses AI models, right? And that's, that's a given. But so before the creator and the consumer use an AI model, can they be assure, assured that the model was trained with valid data sets? And this is something that we've talked through the last, you know, three days here, um, and the the personas are appropriately licensed. And I think this is important because recently there was a major court case with one of the Bollywood actors in India. And, uh, you know, he won it. You know, basically people were using his, his likeness in AI models and he was not, you know, being informed or he was not getting paid or he was not in the, in the loop of it. And so he got a, uh, you know, a judgment, you know, from one of the high courts, I think, in India where they said, oh, you know, nobody can use... Um, you know, his likeness without his permission. And, and so, there, you know, it, it starts to bring in more and more of, you know, similar stuff, you know, similar celebrities standing up or other people standing up saying, hey, I didn't, you know, permit you to use my persona in your AI model, right? Um, and then the third challenge is the model itself isn't malicious and it's supposed to do, and it does what it says it, it, it's supposed to do, right? Uh, and then the fourth one is the code associated with, you know, uh, the, the development and the life cycle of this AI model um, is also, uh, we know the provenance of it, and it's from verifiable sources. And regulatory-wise, this is now being called a software bill of materials, or SBOM, and many of you might be aware of it, right? And I think the White House, you know, had issued some recent regulations, uh, and I think this is going to become a bigger issue in the AI era. Um, so I think, in summary, you know, provenance is the basis, you know, for monetizing and establishing ownership in the AI era. And this is, this is a challenge that I don't think one person or one company uh, can solve. I think this needs to be an industry scale um, uh, 
this is an industry scale problem. It needs an industry scale solution. And we would love to partner with you on all of these, you know, the decompute, the de-storage, and the AI provenance. These, these three, we think, are you know, fairly immediate uh, and urgent needs um, and, and you know, business use cases you know, for the Web3 community. And I would like to introduce what we call as Intel Ignite. Um, and you know, we, Intel Ignite is, is a uh, sort of deep tech, early stage um, you know, startup incubator. Uh, that has done tremendously well. We've uh, we have some, you know, statistics. We've you know vetted like 4,200 plus startups, uh, and about close to 200 startups have been accepted. So there's a 4% accept acceptance rate, um, and there's about close to two billion dollars in funding raised, and one billion dollars in acquisitions uh, from you know of these companies that went through Ignite, um, and, and so on and so forth. So I think we have. Uh, you know, resources uh, that we can bring to bear, especially for companies and startups that are looking at AI provenance, that are looking at essentially bridging the gap from Web 2 to Web 3. With that, I would uh, invite my colleague Mark Connor to take it up from here. Thank you. Right, well, it's been a great um, summit so far, right? Three days, about what, an hour left. You're all doing a grand job, so nearly done. That's the good news. The, uh, the bad news is you're getting my autobiography and I don't even have any diamond backs or fantastic air to soften it, I'm afraid. So about 16, my parents got me uh, Commodore Amiga. Right? I don't know if anybody ever had one of those computers, but they were superb, they were brilliant. They, had, uh, they could do preemptive multitasking, everything else was cooperative multitasking. You had a BeamSync coprocessor and it had a set of ASICs assisting the processor on the motherboard. And the ASICs were all named after mates of the designers. I think there was Agnes and Paula and Denise and all, all sorts of names for these things. There was also a gate array that, that was called Gary. So, um, so this, anyways, this computer, the other special thing about it was at the back of the manual, there was the circuit diagrams. You could have a look at it and see how the thing worked. And as a 16-year-old geek who was going to become a computer engineer, that was fascinating. You could sit there and read it and work out how to build the same thing. So I go to, go to uh, sixth form college, age 16, build a little Z80-based computer on some, mother, on some uh, breadboards that ran at 100 kilohertz or so, go to university, and I want to try and make something a bit more um, ambitious this time. And you know, back then, it was, sort of, it, was, it was reasonable for a single person to build computers. It wasn't as, you know, the same sort of thing it is now. And I designed this computer, and it had all these sort of custom chips in it, but there was no way for me to build the custom chips, right? You know, they, these things were ASICs. Even back then, it was a million dollars to build these things. And I was at university now, and I had, I had alcohol to buy. I couldn't afford the million dollars, right? So, um, so I didn't, right? So that idea got put in the bin. Go to my first company, communications company in the UK. So, uh, so Patrick, if you're there, I know what a T1 is. You're right. <laughs> um, and I discovered FPGAs on this job. So I became an FPGA designer, went off to work for the company that built them, Altera, and here I am. So the point of this is that FPGAs allow any hardware engineer who wants to design microchips to design microchips. The old advertising we used to use for them was it was a, um, a fab on your desktop. Okay, and that's, that's pretty powerful. So this idea of uh, decentralization is a, a logical extension of that start, right? We want to try and empower as many individuals as we can with the sorts of things that previously companies with a lot of money were able to do. So this is what set me on this path. It's why I'm still there doing all these years later. As you can imagine, I am no longer 16. So what are FPGAs? They are programmable custom hardware. They look like that thing on the right, which is directly taken out of the software. Um, it looks like a RAM, right? Because it's pretty much the same structure repeated across the whole chip. It's very, very fine grained. And that's important for how, how, you work, how you work them and why they're a different compute fabric to the CPUs and GPUs that you're also using. So they're it's very important to sort of match the problem you've got to the right fabric and to use all the fabrics available to you to do the best job. So these are very different, and because of that, there's advantages and disadvantages to them. So you have a fine grain distribution. So what looks like what would be sort of just uh, memory cells in a RAM there is a fine distribution of bits of logic, lookup tables, registers, some uh, math functions in DSP blocks, different sizes of memory, small, really, really fast ones, slightly bigger ones, even bigger ones all the way up to HBM on the die and external DDR for when you need really deep depth. They're fast and they're low power. 
And the reason they're low power is they don't throw data around all over the place, and I'll show you some of that later. And the, the way we describe it at Intel to sort of differentiate from the sort of the, uh, the very complex processing you can do in CPUs and the very parallel processing that you do in GPUs is it's a spatial compute fabric. You implement your function, whatever your algorithm is, literally physically. Your data flow diagram ends up being put on the chip. That's actually what happens. The other nice thing about them is they're a completely blank canvas for creativity. So just as, as you would with a CPU or a GPU, you can spend a long time in algorithm design, make sure you've got it fully optimized. You look at how you implement it, make sure you're getting the best out of the hardware beneath it. But you also have control now over the data flow and the buses and things like that. So if you've got something you know, which is pretty finicky about how you present data to it, like something like an HBM or a DDR memory, they really like to be told you know, which locations to fetch in certain orders and stuff like that. With an FPGA, you've got direct access to this stuff. So there's no sort of trying to trick the controller into doing what you want to do. You just tell it what you want to do. And the final bit of creativity you get as well is physical topology. So when you actually put the thing on a chip, if you want to, you can actually tell the software, I want this over there, I want that over there. And that's to balance the delays across the chip and make it run as fast as possible. Uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, that was a great way to get extra performance. But actually, the software has been pretty much excellent for the last you know, five or 10 years. So you'd struggle to beat the software. And the final bit of this puzzle is across the bottom. That's all the different design tools we have for it. So right on the right, we've got Quarter. So this is the thing that the traditional hardware engineers like me uh, would have been using. So this uses RTL languages like VHDL or Verilog that you might have heard. It's a very traditional way to design chips. And it's powerful and it's great, but it's a bit like programming in an assembly. It's really hard work and you don't really want to do it for a chip the size of the things we build now. So we have all these other tools. So a platform designer would let you create systems. You could put down a processor, some memory, some DDR interfaces, Ethernet max, and you don't have to sort of really code. You literally just draw the thing, connect it together, and we build all the buses, put it together, and away you go. You've got the NEOS, which is a soft processor. So that's a little RISC-V processor that you can put down on the chip, and you can put as many as you want down, connect them how you want, all that sort of stuff. So that's brilliant for sort of controlling things. DSP Builder lets you do math. Now, this is something that we'll probably come back to later, because that's obviously, math is something that's it happens a lot in this space, right? One API lets you do C programming, so you can program at higher level languages, and we will basically build the whole chip for you. So you give us an algorithm, we convert that into hardware, put it into the side of the chip. After that, you've got HLS, which lets you sort of design logic blocks in C code. It's a similar thing to one API, but it's just for like individual parts of the chip. SOC lets you use the ARM uh, chips that we have on the die, and then we have the AI suite because we cannot have more than five slides without the letters A and I on a slide. <laughs> Not in 2023. Right, so spatial compute. So this is a very simple idea, right? So if you imagine just taking something as simple as X0 plus X1 times X1 plus X2, right? If you, for a traditional sort of processing system, you'd have fixed hardware on the die for this is the ALU, this does adding, these are my caches, these are my registers. You know, you throw the data around on that. For an FPGA, you, you don't do that. You literally just physically implement you know, the functions you need on the die, and the signals run across the die exactly as they would on your data flow diagram sort of thing, you know, if you mapped out your algorithm like that. So the sorts of cir arithmetic circuit you'd put into a ZK, those arithmetic circuits just look like circuits on a chip, right? That's, I guess, why they're called circuits. The other useful thing is because each processing element isn't time slicing between doing one function and then whatever data it's presented with next, the, the, arith the function, whether it's arithmetic or logical, whatever it is, is always there, which means you can give it new data every clock cycle. So you can pipe, the pipelining just sort of comes naturally. The thing is massively parallel and issuing new, instructs, issuing new results on every clock cycle all the way through. Uh, the other nice thing as well is the bits of wire that are connecting these things. Um, if you don't know, all the power consumption that you get in in microchips is pretty much charging and discharging wires. They're capacitors, you charge them up, you discharge them, that's where your power goes when you clock the things. The shorter your wires, the less power consumption you have. So this is something valuable as well about mapping things in topologies like that. Right, now this is something that's unique to Intel. Um, so this is the fact that we've got an FPJ business, we have a structured ASIC business, and we have an ASIC business. So as you've probably heard, we've got this um, Intel Foundry model now, so we, you know, our foundries are now accessible to everybody. So there's this sort of continuum where you've got FPGAs which are very, very programmable, very custom, you can do what you want with them, and then somebody comes up with a new algorithm, and you can throw it your piece of paper, throw it in the bin, and then do it again, download your chip again, and you're away. So it's sort of got that flexibility that you'd have in software. 
Now, if you are very certain that your hardware is fixed, you know, you might have had an FPGA, you might have had it in the field for a year, you've got no bugs, no problems, everybody's happy, then you can press a button and convert that into something called a structured ASIC. Now, structured ASICs are what became of gate arrays from the past, right? So that, that sort of Gary chip. Um, a structured ASIC, so an, an FPGA is totally programmable, the whole thing, the logic, the routing, the whole thing, right? You can do what you want with it. A structured ASIC's got the logic fixed at the bottom of the chip, and then you just change the routing. So what that means in terms of silicon is that, you know, the lower, I don't know how many layers, 10 layers, whatever it is sort of thing, the lower number of layers are fixed, we fab them, they're all ready. And what you pay us for is just a couple of layers of metal to configure the thing. So that means that you've you know, reduced the size of your FPGA a lot, it's got faster, it's got much, much lower power, and it becomes cheaper, but you have to pay us a chunk of money for us to sort of create the chip, right? That's money's an NRE. But the sort of NRE you pay for a structured ASIC is nowhere near the sort of money you pay for an ASIC, right? Now, if your product has gone into a structured ASIC and it's doing incredibly well, your volumes are shooting up, then you've got the option to go to an ASIC. There's a couple of kinds. There's different technologies you can go to. You could go all the way to the state-of-the-art processes we've got. Now, by the time you get to an ASIC, that's the smallest possible chip. It's the fastest possible to make it. It's the lowest power it's possible to make the thing. It's, it's essentially, you know, the best you can get in silicon sort of thing. And it's worth remembering that FPGAs and GPUs and CPUs are ASICs. They're just ASICs designed to do those tasks, right, to emulate the logic or to be a general processor. So you get this sort of continuum where you've got the changing cost prices. As you get a smaller die, the thing gets cheaper, you know, you make more money, but you also have this higher cost of entry to do it. So, you know, an FPJ costs almost nothing. And you can download our software for free for most of the devices and just play with it and away you go. Making a state-of-the-art ASIC nowadays, you're going to be one, a really big company with a huge amount of money, especially if you're doing, going to do things like connect it to HBM and stuff like that, which is, you know, makes the packaging more complex. The other thing you have to be is very confident because if you have a bug in your ASIC, then you go back and you pay your NRE again and you respin it and somebody's very angry with you. So back in the old days, I spent 20 years as an FAE sort of going around helping customers with problems. And I found two customers that had a literal foam finger of blame. So if you were an ASIC designer and your ASIC didn't work, eventually obviously they're gonna work out why the thing didn't work. And the finger of blame would get attached to your desk until the next ASIC, when it would get moved to whoever else broke the ASIC. So you had to live with that for like a year or two. So anyway, the, the point being that with Intel, because we have this sort of fab model where we, we've got, we own the fabs, we've got the logic as well on the side of it, you can choose where you want to be, right? You prove your stuff in an FPGA and move on later to structured ASICs or ASICs as your volume goes up and your confidence rises with your design. Right. And then mapping this back more into blockchain, ZK, all that sort of stuff. So we want to contribute to the space. If we are involved in a particular market, we'd normally turn up, like we don't turn up empty-handed, we normally turn up with some IP with us. If, you know, if it's radar, we'll do beamforming, all that sort of stuff. If you're doing mobile telephony, we'll have FFTs and fur filters for you. And in you know, networking, we'll have Ethernet, Max, and TCP accelerators and stuff. So when a market is valuable and mature and has utility, then we'll do our best to invest in it and to try and build stuff as well. So we're, we're taking the first steps along that path. So what you're looking at here is um, the design we've got for an MSM. So for those of you who don't know, and I'm, there's a lot of photographers in the room, I'm sure um, absolutely know all this stuff. When you're doing a ZK proof, there's two big compute intensive parts of it. You've got the MSM, which is about 70% of the time, it's a multi-scalar multiplier, if I, if I remember rightly, and about 30% of the time you're doing a number theoretic transform, an NTT. Um, so we obviously, if we're going to build some IP, we're going to go for the, the slowest bit of it. So this is an MSM designed to, designed to accelerate that. Now, because of the space and because it's, um, you know, FPJs might be new to a lot of people in the space. And, you know, there's a lot of people in the space, by the way, they're not new to have, have piled into the things already. But we've tried to design it to make it accessible to anybody who wants to get involved with it. So those tools I was talking about earlier, the one API, the high level entry and stuff like that. The top level of the chip is designed in one API and it uses that to create a software stack. So you can access the chip. Uh, we've got the whole software from the, from the PC side all the way into the FPGA and the borders of the FPGA where it interfaces with the rest of the system. Okay, and inside that, we've got uh, kernels, which is written as HLD there, which is higher level design, but it's the same thing as HLS, high level synthesis. So we've got blocks inside that, the kernels, which are designed also in C and then converted into, into hardware. Inside that, if you look down there, you'll see a block called ECA uh, with RTL on it, Registered Transfer Language. That's the actual custom hardware. That's where we use that, um, the low-level hardware languages to get the absolute best out of the silicon. 
right? So the, the multipliers at the bottom of it, the things that limit the performance, that's custom hardware. And the, the code for this is accessible, right? So this is something that we want to make available to our customers. So if you talk to us, and the email will be at the end of it, we'll make this code available to you, and you can use it in your own designs. I mean, on our chips, obviously, you know, we've, we've not, gone that, <laughs> not gone that far, right? But you can use the design on our chips and modify it. And the idea is you make the best of it. You're going to know something algorithmically that we don't. And you can take our multipliers, put them in your design, and it will make your design better. And that's what we want, right? So this is, the intention of this is to, for a start, kickstart people to get them part of the way along the route. So you've already got this whole software stack. You can just literally download it and move into the rest of it. But also to you know, allow, allow people to do essentially what they want with it, right? So you can use the best of your stuff, the best of our stuff. And usually the, the stuff we're good at is usually the low level stuff, the multipliers and things like that and make something really good with your own creativity. Now, as a hardware person who's moved into business development, it's traditional for me to pretend that I made this, but before I move on to the next slide, I'm gonna thank um, uh, Shazad, VR, Ben, uh, Rita, and uh, Sergey for building this thing, because they've done a phenomenal job. We've got some fantastic engineers back in the factory. So this is one of the FPGAs. Um, We've maybe used up too much space in the package for the, the name of the chip on the top, but that's essentially what it is. <laughs> so you've got a fabric at the bottom. So this one's got an HBM in it. So this is the latest chip that we've just released, okay? So this is uh, an Agilex 7M series. The M means it's got HBM in there. So there's 32 gigs of HBM 2E uh, with, I think it's 820 gigabytes a second of bandwidth for that. Um, now for MSM, you don't really need that. For NTTs, that's really useful, and also for some other functions as well. So that high, ma high, high bandwidth memory is fantastic. And also, we've got this thing you can probably see on the picture called a, a, a hard memory network on chip, a NOC. That sort of makes that HBM accessible to the whole chip, so all your logic isn't sort of like magnetically attracted to the top of the chip and gets stuck up there. So that's the key thing about this chip. And the other really important thing, and there's obviously there's other stuff as well there. You've got memory interfaces if you want really deep memory, so you've got DDR5 and all that sort of stuff. You've got PCIe Gen 5 by 16. You've got a CXL interface as well for uh, coherent memory access with the rest of the system. So it's very powerful. And the transceivers, by the way, is, would let you communicate chip to chip at extraordinarily high speeds. The other key thing about this, though, is that Intel 7 process fabric. So this is a... The thing about um, process fabrics is... I mean, there's cryptographers in the room, right, who know finite field arithmetic and elliptic curves and all that sort of stuff, right? I'm a hardware engineer. I know... Boolean logic and Carnot maps, you know, it's a little bit simpler. By the time you get down to the process engineers, they struggle with numbers, to be honest with you. So when it says seven, you can't really compare sevens across different people. Some of them are in dog nanometers, some of them are on measured off chips accelerated to nearly the speed of light and measured by a stationary observer. So if you're comparing process technologies from one vendor to another, you pretty much have to Google it and look at the comparisons. So if you do that, you'll find Intel 7 is a phenomenal process. We're, we're, we're very proud of it. So these chips will, they run extremely fast. They're way faster than our previous generation chips, and they are twice as power efficient for the performance as other FPGAs, okay? Now that is massive, that is a huge reduction in power, and that is because it's on a state-of-the-art process on an already very, very good chip. Right, so in summary, uh, we really want to partner with you to solve the uses and challenges, and we've, we're trying our best to do that already, and we've had some great feedback and great interaction with people already. We want to continue with that. If you're interested in the Intel Ignite program, we've got the web address up there. Get in touch with us. Um, the other thing as well is we offer the full route for hardware ZK Provers. If you want to get involved with hardware, FPGA is a great way to do it at low cost and to try things out, and you can migrate the whole route along to full, full custom ASICs for the absolute ultimate in performance. And we have that kickstart design as well. So just get in touch with us. My email is on there. We are very keen to work with you on that. OK, and with that, I wanted to say, and on behalf of me, me and Mutu, uh, both uh, had a chat about it, we want to say a really, really big thanks to the to DSA, um, who we're thrilled to be a member of now, absolutely thrilled about that. Uh, the Filecoin Foundation, Protocol Labs, and actually the attendees at this summit. You've been phenomenally welcoming. It's been absolutely brilliant to exchange ideas, to learn from you, and to have the interactions and the chats and all that sort of stuff. So a big thanks to all of you. We really appreciate it. OK, finally, before we're done, um, we have got, I think, a moment for some questions. Awesome. Right, already. OK, so do you guys need to? Oh, we have a microphone in the audience. So if any of you have got any questions for either of us, just let us know who the question's for and, and go ahead. So thank you very much indeed. Mark, can we go back two slides? Uh, I'll try. Um, let's see. <laughs> yeah, there awesome. We go.
Um, I was wondering, like, how does streaming work with this FPGA? Like, do you, is it like a GPU where you have to load the data on and then wait and then compute and then it goes off, or can you can you like do like full streaming in and out of the chip? Oh, so you want continuous data, like as you're processing the data, data in line. processing, stream it out. Yeah, absolutely, hundred oh, okay, percent, no problem cool. at all. Yeah, no problem at all. You can use the thing literally every cycle, every resource in there. You know, you you try and pipeline everything you can so to keep everything as busy as you can. It, Theoretically, you can keep the whole thing 100% busy, you know, and keep the um, transceivers fully loaded as well. That's great. Cool. Okay, cool. That was my question. Thank you. Ah, cool. Thanks, Nervous. By the way, apologies if I don't look at you. We've got the lights and we can barely see you. <laughs> Any other questions? This is going to be a hard one, isn't it? No. <laughs> <laughs> You're very technically capable. <laughs> So uh, one of the things that uh, has been bugging me, and I, I do not understand the algorithms behind the, the, the proofs in the, I should say, the hashes that make up the Merkle tree. But as I naively look at this problem domain, we're 32 gigabytes wide on the base, and we're creating a, a, a hash at the top that's a product of horizontal and vertical uh, thrashing. Okay. In, this looks like a fantastic solution to do in one or two PCI cards. A lot of this crunching uh, and through sequential algorithms work going through the layers. Does Intel have a product? I'm thinking low powered stuff. I'm thinking uh, Raspberry Pi class compute with very small chunks because if you look at the base structure, the way this Merkle tree is composed, mm -hmm. and if we were able to take the 32 gig linear array that makes up the base and break it up into 20 uh, modules that could chunk it, that uh, so if we if we went horizontal on the compute and the associated hashing to generate these proofs, so we'll split the bottom and run it in parallel for a bit. Right, right. Okay. So instead of instead of getting these massive pipelines that are going to do sequential batch processing of the horizontal linear arrays, you know, and they, and they keep getting shorter and shorter. Is there something that you can envision where there would be a lower cost product where we could? take that 32 gig linear array at the base and break it up into 32 chunks and on less expensive, more commodity hardware, smaller pluggable modules, stack the, the, the hardware stack together like a Christmas tree where each subset of the Christmas tree as it goes out does the same size job, but the job number of jobs in, in parallel become mm -hmm. fewer. At least that's what I'm thinking is, is there something? So for the, are you thinking of having this implemented in FPGA or in some other technology? About uh, FPGAs or very smallish FPGAs, you know, the, okay. this is this is uh, from this I could build all kinds of really wonderful, super high performance things, and I'm thinking more you go mode, but a whole army of them. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. So you can, um, th and th this is the the biggest and the best, right? Yeah, this is, yeah, this, yeah. This is this is this is the, the, the coolest stuff we do, right? This goes all the way down to low cost parts as well, right? So you get you get in parts in the like the few dollars sort of range, right, right at the bottom sort of thing. So it's perfectly feasible to yeah to create systems out of those things, but the you'd normally go for that if there was a physical separation of the things, like because mm -hmm. you know if you if you were put all that together into one chip, you you got complete freedom to have your parallel buses on the chip. So it might make more sense to have, you know, maybe not something as big as this, but something medium sized and have the whole thing on one chip unless things are physically separated and you want to sort of do it at the location and then pull it together. Yeah. So I'm thinking of like a, a, an Intel class NUC, a, a low end Intel class NUC with just enough uh, uh, FPGA to do a small subset of the hashes okay. and stack them together with Thunderbolt. Well, there's some, I mean, we've got some low cost boards. I think the D10, I could be wrong. I th I think that's in the region of like a hundred or two hundred dollars, and that's a pretty small chip, and that's the yeah. whole board and everything else sort of thing. So we have, we do have that stuff all the way down there, and the devices are even cheaper. Right? That's for a sort of a, a system design, you know, for experimentation and playing with. Yeah. But yeah, if you want to do this stuff, right, you got my you got my card, right? Yeah. Just give yeah. me a shout, and I'll draw the thing out with you, and we'll build it. You know, it's uh, yeah, absolutely up for well, that. Uh, if you help me tool, tool me up with some demo boards and. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna ask me while I'm on camera. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the mics just stopped working. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Um, another thing that might be really interesting for the 
you know, tech in this ecosystem. This isn't really for sealing. This is more for like IPFS -y kind of content address networking stuff, which is more interesting for the things in his talk and also for a lot of my company's interests. Um, have you guys, uh, do you guys produce any FPGAs on the network cards, like the Mellanox line or anything like that? I, is Mellanox that or do they just do, I don't know. Anyway, but like, do you guys do the FPGA on network card stuff? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so that, cool. we'd call that an IPU. So we've got various levels of it. You can have just an FPGA on a PCIe card, and we'll, they'll almost always have some sort of networking on the back of them. So usually some QFP sockets, so you can plug in some, you know, some sort of fast networking on the back. So that would literally be a board, an FPGA, and a networking socket on it sort of thing for a PCIe form factor. But we also do them with Xeon processors built in or using the ARM processors on there. So if you wanted some software plus the FPGA on the board doing some inline processing, you could do the whole thing in one system. Yeah, because what I'm thinking might be interesting is like as you as you stream a content stream, because like, you know, some things are moving more towards like the, a lot of the data is moving more towards like streamed data rather than um, packet, 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 packet. Okay. Um, so if you content address that and you do like Blake three verified file transfers, you could verify that in line on the card, um, or like you know, bake signatures lower down on the network stack with these kinds of cards, which I oh, think yeah. like some of the protocols that are being engineered around here are like very like ripe to be productionized with this kind of hardware. Oh yeah, because you could yeah. be computing the signature and that you could compute in the hash as the data is passing through, right? Yeah, exactly. could be a couple of cycles. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Exactly. You could definitely do that. Yeah. 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 Yes, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. These things were designed around that sort of application. So they've got, obviously these things have been around for a while, right? And block, you know, the blockchain area is a lot newer, but this sort of, yeah, in, inline stream processing, it's um, bread and butter. We can, we can do that. I'd cool. love to talk about that for like new network protocol stuff, because we're thinking about that next year. Awesome. So, yeah, we should chat. <laughs> I'd love to. Yeah, yeah. Cheers. Thanks. Right, if we're done for questions, unless there's any more, feel free to uh, stop us later. So I'll, I'll be around for most of the day. You're around for another hour or so? Yeah, a couple hours. Okay, feel free to grab us whenever, have a chat. We're very, very keen to carry on interacting. It's been absolutely wonderful, hasn't it, so far these three days? Absolutely, this has been an eye-opening three days. So thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks.